And we're going to talk about um, ICVFX and virtual production for short form media. Really quick little intro about the company. Um, Synapse is a, uh, a community of uh, uh, directors, cinematographers, uh, visual effects supervisors, previous supervisors, producers, and uh, we've all come together and we're basically using our sort of, um, uh, all of our experience and we're kind of putting together a company that has, uh, using all that knowledge to sort of build up a bit more of a, a filmmaker centric virtual production studio. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about the company. We'll do a little bit of intros. Um, Emily, you want to start? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily Haldeman. I'm our virtual production supervisor at Synapse. Uh, my background is more traditional 3D art, and then I got into VR, I got into Unreal doing a lot of emerging tech stuff. So I approach virtual, produ virtual production for more of like the game engine side. Um, so it's really cool to work with filmmakers and you know come together and really do virtual production from all angles. Hi, everybody. I'm Louise Baker Lee. I'm the executive producer of Previs, VAD, and VFX at Synapse. And I, my background is actually in pre-visualization. I did that for many years, both as an artist and a supervisor on films such as Transformers, The Amazing Spider-Man, Green Hornet, um, among others. And I also did a bunch of traditional VFX for mostly commercials and music videos. And those have kind of naturally converged into where I am now, which is in the virtual art department and VP IC VFX, um, which is where I think pre and post production, sort of all the stars align and come together there. So, and then this is Rich. Yeah, so like I said, my name is Rich Lee. So I'm also a director. So uh, I got my start uh, uh, working actually in the art department on Broadway shows. So I built a lot of shows for things like Beauty and the Beast, Miss Saigon, Fan of the Opera. Uh, on Broadway, uh, worked at Walt Disney Imagineering, helping to build out some of their uh, theme parks uh, for Japan and for Los Angeles, and got into pre-visualization, right? And uh, ended up being a, a, a previous supervisor on a lot of movies, um, overlapping with Louise. Uh, I Am Legend, Constantine, Minority Report, uh, the first three parts of the Caribbean movies, really using 3D technology, uh, Maya and a now defunct soft homage XSI to create uh, 3D pre-visualizations of the action scenes that would then inform how we would shoot them, right? How visual effects, stunts, how lighting and all these things would sort of come together and help, you know, basically those different departments figure out what they were going to do. Uh, and then got into directing, so a lot of music videos for Eminem, The Black Eyed Peas, Rihanna, Lana Del Rey, Billie Eilish, and naturally progressioning into uh, commercials for a lot of big brands like Adobe, Amazon, uh, Lexus, uh, Apple, things like this. Um, so like I said, we're going to talk about short form uh, or ICV effects uh, and short form media. But before we jump into that, we're, we're actually going to be talking a lot about kid bashing. I think you know, a lot of what we do you know, with uh, these projects, you know, they're, they're quick turnarounds. And so creating a lot of bespoke assets sort of doesn't always happen. So we're, we're doing a lot of kit bashing with a lot of different things in the marketplace and other, other places. Um, but before we get into sort of some of the specific projects that, that we've done, we're gonna look at some commercials and some music videos. I just wanna do a quick little, little quiz here. So I'm just gonna go to this slide. I just want the audience participation moment. So does anybody know what this is? Right? Multiple choice question should be kind of easy. <laughs> it's an, yeah, it so, that sounds about right, right? Yeah. You think, yeah, you think it looks like a copy grinder. Actually, it's Mr. Fusion, right? Yeah, so it's the thing that Doc put the banana peel and the, coffee and the, uh, the beer can into to get them into the future again, right? So again, kid bashing, right? People going out and, you know, time and pressure trying to figure out how they're gonna make this thing, why build it from scratch, why reinvent the wheel when, hey, I got a really nice coffee maker that looks the part. Uh, let's see here, what about this? Yeah, really, this, is, this is a tough one. Uh, is Qui-Gon Jinn's communicator? <laughs> Crazy, right? I mean, how, who would have, <laughs> it's totally ridiculous. But you give it a little coat of paint and suddenly you've got uh, Liam Neeson talking into it and, and uh, yeah, it's a whole thing. This one should be a little easier. Right, yes, Luke's lightsaber. So again, probably one of the most iconic movie props in movie history. If you go, see so if I can go back really quick. 
literally all they did was they removed the dome from the flash and added some little plastic bits and suddenly you have Luke's lightsaber. And here's a model shot from ILM. Again, showing this just because this is, this is kind of where the term kit bashing came from, right? If you look at um, you know, what's behind these guys are you know, model kits and what are they doing? They're bashing them together to create, this is actually the Millennium Falcon. And uh, they used a lot of tank parts, right? So you can see some of these, these plastic bits they are just gluing to the top of it and, uh, and, and putting this thing together. And uh, you know, with some paint and you know, suddenly you've got, again, another one of the most iconic uh, things in movies that we've ever seen. Um, and I think really what this is all about is being resourceful under time and budgetary pressure. You got to just think on your feet. You got to come up with whatever you can find around you. And in terms of short form media, um, not only is the form short, but so are the time frames. So production schedules, availability of talent, uh, all of the above. And we'll be talking a little bit about commercials and music videos, but. Generally speaking, a music video will have maybe one to two weeks of prep. And so, you know. If we're lucky. If you're lucky. And sometimes there are really big ideas that you want to be able to achieve. And so, you know, one of the benefits of not having a lot of time is that you don't have enough time to sort of double think the crazy things, double, you know, what's the word? Overthink, Overthink the yeah. things that you're, that you're about to get into and you just kind of go and you use all the resources available. And one of the things that we have found um, in these specific test cases is that using Unreal and using and ICVFX and VP um, is, are actually wonderful solutions for some of the problems that we <clears throat> face and some of the challenges that we need to kind of overcome. Yeah. All right, so I'm definitely not trying to draw any analogies that the work that we're about to show is anywhere near at the iconic level that you know, Star Wars is, but you know, we're kind of taking a lot of the things that were uh, you know, done back in the day and we're using all this technology that we have at our disposal, right? all the sort of marketplace stuff. So speaking a little bit more about what Louise brought up, you know, kit, ba you know, kit bashing under duress, right? We had two weeks to put uh, this music video together for Jackson Wang. Uh, all of this was uh, virtual production. All the backgrounds uh, were VP shot on an LED wall. And uh, yeah, two weeks to prep. It was basically a week, to, a week to build, a week to optimize on the stage. And let's keep going here. And you can see some of the assets that we used uh, to put these together, right? So we've got Evermotion, uh, big, medium, small, and some fire elements using Niagara from the marketplace. And again, here's some of the, and again, I just want to draw a little bit of parallel, you know, just again, just thinking about, you know, model kits, how they would come, right, with all the little pieces, like in the little plastic thing, not too dissimilar from some of these asset packs that we get from all these different um, uh, sort of asset vendors, right? So we used all of this stuff to create uh, one of our, which is actually two environments. So this is kind of how it all came together to create this post-apocalyptic urban, urban landscape. So this, is all, this all went um, onto the walls, all live, unreal, driving uh, with, with 3D tracking. And again, we'll get into a little detail here. So you can kind of see just you know, how some of these pieces, right, really just kind of, you know, all these little elements, you know, these, this, this silo and the fire elements and all these cables, right? Literally everything here in the background was unreal. And we built out just a few uh, a little bit of foreground uh, for the actors to interact with. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll, all of this stuff is amazing, right? All looks fantastic. But of course, once you get it up onto the wall, there's a lot of work that needs to happen in terms of optimizing it for the wall. Yeah, so a lot of times, as somebody who's responsible for getting these things to run at frame rate, you get these absolutely stunning environments. But I look at this and I'm like, oh my God, there's fire, there's smoke, there's debris. These assets are coming from like who knows where on the internet, right? Um, it's really cool to be able to kit bash assets from all kinds of industries, whether it's gaming, uh, arc viz, traditional rendering. But a lot of those assets aren't made to run at a particular frame rate. So a lot of what we have to do is optimize. Um, I'm not gonna go into how to optimize assets individually. There's been a ton of great talks on that. Um, and there are as many ways to optimize things as there are people doing it. So 
What I am gonna talk about is some of the methods that we use when we're on a really tight timeline to see what's kind of the problem here, you know, what can we do to reduce our frame rate and to get it to run on the LED walls. So one of the first things that I do when I get a scene is I go into the optimization view modes. These are super helpful because usually when you don't have a game and you don't have uh, game logic and AI and things like that to worry about, the biggest things that are eating up your frame rate are lights, uh, your geometry, and your shaders. So this is a really cool way to see you know, what areas of your scene are causing problems or are just really heavy to render. Uh, the bottom left here, we have light complexity. This is actually the biggest thing we ended up taking down um, with this environment. Uh, each of the fires came with like their own spotlights and their own point lights. Um, and we ended up taking a lot of that out and using vape lighting um, just to try to keep that look while still running at frame rate. Uh, because if you look on the right side of this, uh, you can see shader complexity, quad overdraw, and you see a lot of white. You, know, you see a lot of things that are typically in the, the bad to uh, extremely bad, in Epic's words. And when you open that, you know, you immediately panic, right? Like, oh my God, there's fire everywhere, but that's kind of the point of this environment. What do we do? Um, so we did need to keep that, and we needed to find other ways to kind of balance out the weight of our scene, right? So we do have things that are in the white range here. So like shader complexity and quad overdraw, you can see the fire is the problem because you have a lot of um, cards that are basically overlapping, right? It's uh, showing you here how many times uh, you have to go through a material to render your final pixel out. So our fire was something that we did have to go in and optimize a little bit uh, because it is a particle system using uh, cards. But it's something that we were able to actually keep in this scene by taking things like lighting down and working with that that way. Um, Unreal Insights is a really great way to see what's wrong with your scene or what's weighing it down if you have a lot of time to deep dive. When we have really, really short tur turnarounds, we don't always have that available to us. So one of the really cool things is um, the stats that you can pull up in Editor. You don't have to open anything else. It's just right there for you. Um, there's a little drop down here. You can also get to it using a console command. And this is a great way to break down your scene and see what is really taking up time with rendering. So you can see if there's like one particular thing in this environment that's really heavy. Um, it'll give you a lot of jargon. You can Google those individually and see is this something that I actually need or is it something we can work to take out and reduce. And then the last thing I want to mention on optimizing is screen percentage. This is a thing in ICVFX that we use as kind of our last ditch effort. I uh, definitely don't recommend going to it right away, but if you need your environment to be on the screen in two minutes and you're like, oh my God, how do we do that? Uh, this, is, this is kind of a go-to uh, last ditch effort. So basically what this is gonna do is take down your resolution and lower kind of what you actually need to be rendering. So we only do this with the outer frostum so that the inner frostum integrity is still there. Um, it's not great for things like car shoots or anything that has like metal that needs to be one-to-one -one reflective because you will see that drop in resolution. But if it's just your outer frost stem and you really have to hit frame rate like right now, this is a good thing to go to. And just to follow up on what Emily is saying, one of the things that makes all of this work, and this is sort of stating the obvious, is having a fantastic and nimble team at all times in all departments. Um, and what we're looking at right here is a grayscale representation of the LED wall that we were shooting this particular video on. And this, because we had built the environment first, um, we had an opportunity to work with our practical art department and our production designer and to really show her visually that what was beyond the walls was gonna be our virtual world, and what was within the walls was gonna be her practical set. And the other benefit was that we had so much uh, to look at in terms of how the assets that we were using from all of the different 3D sources um, that she had a really terrific reference then when she went out to the uh, set shops and prop houses to find sort of similar asset packs, as you know, as it were, in the real world. So in that case, we were really able to marry the practical art department 
with the virtual art department. And that really sells the illusion um, in virtual production. It's sort of critical to making it all come together and work. Yeah, and, and just to add a little bit about that too is, you know, VP is still, you know, new to a lot of people and it's new to a lot of crew members. And there was a, I would say with most people other than sort of certain keys, you know, the production editor is one of them, this was a new experience. So there was a lot of education that took place, you know. So as we're, as we're putting these environments together and as we're sort of trying to inform the art department about, about how much we needed to shoot, um, you know, it was just a process of like onboarding people and letting them know sort of how this works and then how, how they fit into the puzzle, right? And it was very, very helpful for them really took out a lot of the, the guesswork. Um. Yeah, and this is just uh, sort of the round trip of starting with the Unreal environment, which we built first, and then being able to use it to plan and to, it's sort of an ultimate previs tool with all of the departments, planning out where dancers would be, where you need a runway, where the practical set pieces would be, and then you know everything beyond. Um, down on the bottom right is an image from, that was from the set on the day um, with all of the practical uh, set pieces in the front, in the foreground, including some sort of old school fire gags, um, and then the virtual set in the background. And then finally on the left, bottom left is the final product, so an image from the video itself. Uh, one last thing before we show a little bit more from the video is there's a little tool. We discovered this not too long ago, and I wish we had discovered it much sooner. There's this thing called the actor palette. I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but this has been like the, it was, there was an epiphany, and we had a moment when we discovered this. And what this lets you do, and just thinking about sort of kit bashing and really trying to move quickly, is it lets you have your uh, Unreal level open, and it lets you have another level open at the same time, right, like an asset pack. And you can quickly uh, navigate through grab and drag elements into your scene. And, it, and you know, Unreal was already really fast before in terms of moving things around and building your scene, but this, this really starts to expedite things. So this has been a huge find that we've been using it a ton recently. So this is, uh, I highly recommend everyone who, who's into kit bashing and doing this stuff, just play around with this. It's a really fun tool. And so here's a little cut over. Here's some uh, behind the scenes overcut with uh, some of the final footage. I think one of the things just to talk about too is just, just how sort of, uh, gosh, empowering this sort of technology has been, right? Um, you know, if this were done traditionally, right, whether it was, you know, a blue screen stage or a location, there'd be a tremendous amount of visual effects work that would need to be done to accomplish these, these visuals, right? And, a lot of this music video was, you know, 20, 30 second long handheld takes around dancers and the cameras moving everywhere, tons of parallax, you know, we had cameras on technocrans. And again, to do this traditionally, I know for a fact my producers would be coming up to me and just telling me that I had to shoot everything locked off because we couldn't afford to do the tracking or any of those things. Um, and another sort of benefit of this too was, I actually didn't tell my editor that we were shooting this using virtual production. So he called me after he got the footage and he was revealing the dailies. And he was sort of bewildered because he's like, I don't understand what I'm looking at. Like, I, there's no way you guys shot anything like this. So something's up. And once I kind of, you know, gave him a peek behind the curtain and you know, sort of was mind was blown. And he's a really fast editor. We had a cut after two days that looked incredible. And the only sort of visual effects work we had to do in the whole video was, Every once in a while, the characters sort of breathe fire out of each other and we glow their eyes. And uh, the occasional, you know, um, LED, oops, LED panels uh, don't love um, heat, right? The fire is no good because it'll melt the pixels. So we ended up adding some fire back in, in post. And uh, this particular stage we were shooting at had a very tight seam between the wall and the ceiling. So there was just a very little amount of of uh, cleanup to do there. And we were also using uh, inside out tracking, which meant that we didn't have any sort of visible cameras uh, on that scene. Just quickly, I just wanna jump in and say that um, you can't also underestimate the power of having these visuals for all of the performers themselves. They felt like they were in the world. They felt like they were part of this crazy apocalypse and it, and it affected how they performed, whereas you know, traditionally maybe they would be against blue screen or green screen or in a very small version of what this, you know, 
becomes be, would become later. Yeah, it's the classic. Effects. You know, you've, everyone's heard the stories about like the big blue screen wall with like a T Rex head on a stick, and everyone's trying to imagine what the thing is. You're, the, the actors are in the world, and so every after every take, the dancers were coming around to view uh, what we had just shot, and they were excited, and, and just it, it was infectious. So it really does sort of help the performance. Uh, so here is a commercial that we did uh, for Raid Shadow Legends starring Ronda Rousey. Uh, so the tricky thing about this one was it was a 10 hour day and, with celebrity talent and we had four locations. I'm gonna play the, the commercial. People think that I'm really intense, but it couldn't be farther from- Defeat. What the f Raid Shadow Legends? Put me in the game. <laughs> Miss Rousey. <laughs> we already have hundreds of champions, so. Put me in the game. We, we should definitely do that. Access granted. Now you will need a weapon. Oh, hello. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Ah! So again, four locations, uh, celebrity talent, 10 hour day, traditionally very, very challenging to do. You know, the, maybe you can do it with, with not a celebrity and kind of drag them around to locations, but it's very tight, right? So the traditional way to do this, if we could even do it right, we'd have four different locations, right? Her house, the exterior of the office, the boss's office, and then this, this lab. There's just no way to get around town. You know, we'd never find a location that did all of those things really close together. Uh, there's a world where maybe we build some of these sets on stage. That would have blown up our budget. So if the traditional version where we're using locations, this probably would have needed to be two days. Um, the version of this where we built the set sets for all of these probably would have made this idea not achievable just because of budget. Um, so we use virtual production. Again, kit bashing, just a tremendous amount of assets from the marketplace. And uh, yeah, we built out all of these environments, everything, and, and it had very minimal foreground set pieces, but we still had some nonetheless because it really goes a long way to sort of sell the illusion, right? So with her house, uh, you know, we had some foreground chairs, um, you know, some, some foreground pro uh, uh, benches and things like this for the, the exterior of the office. The boss had a, a desk and I think that was about it um, with, with some of his tchotchkes. And then the, the, the actual lab, I think, was just some, some carts, uh, some road cases. And you can kind of see here how it breaks down, right? So uh, sofa and the virtual environment behind her. So here's, uh, this is another project. Again, this is a one day shoot, two commercials this time. Uh, I'm only gonna show you one of them. Uh, uh, Jay Shetty, uh, this is for BMW, five environments, also car process. And then something, uh, the director threw us a curveball. Uh, towards the end of the process, which I'll talk about in a beat. So let's watch the commercial. Spaces have energy. We embody them. They're a vital force for pursuing our potential and passion. Immerse yourself in places that bring you peace and joy. Let your outer world shift your mind. BMW, the ultimate electric driving machine. Okay, so this was uh, all virtual production. Um, you know, there's a handful of, of uh, pieces of stock footage thrown in there. Um, and here were some. Um, with, we, had, right? we had a, a really talented, bad team that used just a tremendous amount of mega scans and really well. I mean, they have obviously a very good sense of composition and lighting and, and uh, they did such a great job that uh, Rich will speak to it, but the, we actually did more than we thought we were gonna do in terms of um, what the VAD was gonna be used for. Yeah, so we had an edit and as the director was sort of looking at everything and you know, he realized that you know, he was sort of missing some elements, right? He wished he had a couple of aerial shots or maybe some POV shots of the vehicle driving, right? We were only supposed to be doing the, the virtual production LED screen portion of this. But as the environment started to come through, we started to see that, you know, they were starting to look really good and just asking, you know, can we, can we spit out some shots from the environment? And I'm actually gonna go back to the commercial. 
and I'll just point out. Spaces have energy. Some shots that ended up that were we CG. This one here. Them. They're a vital force for pursuing our potential and passion. Immerse yourself in places that bring this you one. peace and joy. Let your outer world shift and your this mind. Guy. So I think BMW. the BMW. I think the takeaway here is just that, you know, as, it, again, it, it, this, this happens a lot. The more we sort of work within the engine and the more we're sort of, you know, pushing the visuals here, we're, there's like these little unlock moments where we start to realize, like, well, shoot, like, this all looks so good. Yeah, let's try it. Let's see what happens. And we spit those shots out, I think, in less than a day. And again, they made it into the edit. And with this style of editing, you know, given that there was a ton of other sort of stock elements being mixed in, it, it kind of doesn't call attention to itself. And I thought it worked really well. Uh, this is, so we did all of the car process work, um, you know, live uh, LED with 3D tracking. These are just some renders that we would spit out um, so the client could kind of see what some of the environments look like. Um, and again, this is something that, you know, as a director was seeing this stuff, just started to give him, you know, the idea that maybe we can pull out some other non-VP shots out of it. Okay. Uh, so this is a music video that I directed uh, a few months ago. This was, I'm gonna show this to you, this was not intended to be any sort, we did, we did some light virtual production in terms of, um, we did some uh, old school rear screen projection for some car process work. And again, this wasn't meant to be any, we weren't supposed to be messing around with Unreal in this at all, but this is a music video. You know, the schedules are highly chaotic when you're, when you're doing a lot of these kinds of things. And, we had to start cutting shots. Uh, one of the shots that we had to cut didn't have Lana in the shot, and it was kind of the first to kind of go. But it was kind of a critical moment in the commercial, and I was like, all right, well, I'll punt that to another day, and we'll try and figure out uh, how, we, how we can achieve that later. We also ran out of money, so there was no real sort of achieving it later. And, you know, there's no way I could afford to get a location or a, 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 the car or the camera or any of it, right? So, and, and it was kind of critical. So it, I had this, again, playing around with Unreal so much. I mean, just had this moment of like, wait a minute, we could do this all in, why don't we just try to do this in Unreal? And found the same uh, car asset, you know, the, the same exact car that she was in in the music video, uh, pulled down from Turbo Squid, threw the automotive shaders uh, onto it to sort of materialize it all, built the environment. We were, um, we wanted to shoot it in a parking lot uh, in downtown LA, so I went and I shot an HDR uh, at night, used that uh, for the backdrop, and just, you know, mega scans assets, tons of decals, painting foliage, and just some, some nice lighting and making it black and white. And, you know, it made it into the final piece. Lots of blood, because the whole idea here is that she ends up dead and into the trunk of this car, but. It's a whole other thing. You watch the video, it'll make maybe a little bit more sense. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just again, just I, I think my, uh, I, the screen record of this was, it was about seven hours of footage and I was recording everything. I think I may have forgotten a couple times that I went to go get a cup of coffee or something and I left it running. Seven hours, give or take, to put this together um, beginning to end, which again, I, just a little mind blowing to think that, that this is something that's available to us and that we can just kind of on a whim decide to do something like this. So very, very cool. Um, little side note here, that little piece of fabric that's coming out of the uh, car was made by my 10 year old daughter in uh, Marvelous, Marvelous Designer. Designer. Yeah, so she was very excited. She got a piece of, of clothing um, here. And, and this is sort of the final shot. And again, because of the style of the editing that we were doing and we're doing a lot of overlays you know, it, it really sort of sat in. Yeah, there's some render issues with some clipping of the highlights and whatnot, but whatever. It's a music video and it's on YouTube, so it's all good. Um, let's see here. Uh, here's another music video that we did for Jackson Wang. Uh, again, he came back. He loved the process so much. He like texted me in the middle of the night one day and he was just like, hey, can we do another one using virtual production? Um, which is funny for an artist to request. Uh, this one was all um, sort of a cyberpunk circus theme. Again, lots of choreography, lots of long handheld cameras, um, you know, capturing all this very dynamic action. Oh, a little shout out to uh, Ember Gen, which was an absolute lifesaver with all this sort of volumetric smoke that we were doing. Um, so we used um, 
I'll talk about it in a little bit, but we used AI to sort of help uh, sort of design some of the elements. We had less time on this one than the previous one. We had a week uh, to do the entire build out of the environment and testing, which was terrifying. And then we also uh, did things like motion capture, uh, uh, motion control. So that's this guy. And yeah, just here's a, just a few examples. I know we're sort of digressing from a little bit of in-camera effects, but this was back when um, uh, Mid-Journey just started out. We did this around this time last year, so Mid-Journey was starting to percolate, and so we threw you know, a few prompts in. I think it was just like you know, cyberpunk circus and the apocalypse, and we got things like this, which are actually very handy. And based off of this, um, we started to get into, well, if we could do that, maybe we can do some other elements that can actually make it into the video. Yeah, you know, we wanted some of the classic posters that you know, are line the entrances of a circus. And, you know, under the time pressure that we had, we thought, how could we get any kind of cyberpunk poster designs? Well, Midjourney was a perfect uh, solution to that. And, and they ended up in the video on posters in the video. No concept artists uh, were lost in making this video. We would never have had the money to pay for them anyway. So it was just kind of one of these, it was a little bonus. But, um, and uh, yeah, so let's see, this is how they look in the video. The posters look really cool. Um, here is just all of the assets that, yeah. It was kind of like a, a extravaganza of kit bashing from um, the marketplace in this particular case. Really like a shopping spree, like the old Nickelodeon, you know, I don't know if anyone remembers that, but you know, when you won something, you just get everything. And then we could just kind of drag in all the pieces that we wanted and it was, incredibly helpful and critical to making the time work. So that's that, and here's how some of these assets come together. Um, little anecdote, this was actually a problem. I remember, again, we had a week to do this, right? And I remember, Emily, right, we threw this up on the wall for mm -hmm. the first time, and we're like, what the hell is going on in the background? And it took us a minute to realize that you know the Ferris wheel. You know when you run when you run this stuff on the screen, you know everything comes to life. That the Ferris wheel and all these crazy swings in the background actually had physics and they were meant to move. To us, we just thought it was a glitch. So I think for a minute there, we were freaking out that everything was breaking, and because uh, it was doing even worse than this. But we just realized, oh yeah, turn physics off and we're all it also good. turned. It just turned out that we put wires everywhere and they were actually hitting them. colliding with yeah, every the every cable. Right. It was like, what is going on? We all had a little minor heart attack. Um, and then, oh, and you know, just to make our lives even harder, I thought it would be really cool to throw in some motion control. Yeah, that was a, a fun request two days before the shoot. Um, it actually was, it was a lot of fun. Um, when they came in with this giant robot arm and were like, hey, we've got some motion control shots we wanna do uh, on the wall, can you do that? And we were like, yeah, we'll figure it out. Um, so we actually used it to achieve zero latency ICV effects, which is like a huge deal for when you're doing whip pans or fast camera movements. Um, without that, if you had a traditional like camera and you're doing really fast movements, you risk outpacing your frustum, which is like worst nightmare, right? You see the outer frustum behind your, uh, behind your talent. So we actually didn't get zero latency. We did have eight frames that was just due to hardware and the way that physics is in the world. Uh, you can't really achieve zero latency at this point. But since we had the motion control arm and we knew where it was gonna be eight frames in advance, we were able to grab that data early, send it early to account for the eight frames and end up with a net zero latency. So everywhere that the camera was moving and looking was exactly where it needed to be at that frame. So it was really cool, it was really useful for these fast movements. We didn't have to make our frustum super big and take up all of our rendering power and we were able to achieve um, really fast movements without worrying about any of that. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, initially this, we thought about using the motion control for this particular shot just because Jackson had this idea of just wanting these really fast camera movements around them as they performed. And we were gonna do this sort of, a little bit more sort of scrappy with, you know, our camera operator kind of doing it and just was looking really bad. So thankfully we figured this out and that worked really well. And since we had that, I was like, well, shoot, why don't we use it you know, we had this scene where Jackson comes and dances with the classic kind of, you know, person cut in half, right? So uh, there's a bit where, um, you know, meaning his torso on the table and his legs um, dancing with Jackson. And so we were just gonna do this locked off um, 
which is boring. So we just thought, well, why, you know, now we can track with the movements. We can put this really nice camera movement in. And we shot it in passes and uh, just put it all together, and it worked really, really well. So anyway, that's everything that we have to talk about for now. We'd love, uh, you know, thanks for coming. Anyone has any questions, please, we'd love to, um, to answer them if we can. We've been requested to use this microphone, which everyone probably knows at this point. But yeah, we'd love to take a minute and see if yeah, you guys have anything else. But thank you for coming. <laughs>